Welcome to HEC TV's live interactive program that's part of St. Louis. The whole production is pulled together. It's going to be a steel bridge. The way the cockpit is designed, the highest rated green building in the world. Welcome to HEC TV Live. Today on HEC TV Live, we're very happy to bring you our program, The Science Behind Rivers and Dams. The images you're seeing right now are still images that we received from Coast Guard personnel, the Army Corps of Engineers, the folks at the Great Rivers Museum in Alton, of various operations on the Mississippi River. You're seeing right there a beautiful image of the city of St. Louis as a barge goes down, and the image you're seeing right there is of the Melvin Price Lock and Dam in Alton, Illinois. And there, of course, you see the flowing waters of the Mississippi River indeed. Mississippi River is about 2,200 and some odd, nearly 2,300 miles from its beginnings at Lake Itasca in Minnesota until it empties into the Gulf of Mexico, obviously just south of New Orleans. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Gore, your host for HEC TV Live, and I'm very happy to welcome you to today's program. Well, we're excited to talk about the nature of the watershed and managing the watershed of the Mississippi River. And obviously, we're talking about an extremely important topic in an area of the country that really influences a great many people's lives, whether it's through agriculture, whether it's through its economic and industrial uses, whether it's through recreational uses, whether it's through drinking supplies, all of that is a part of what we're talking about when we talk about preserving the watershed of the Mississippi River. I'm happy to welcome all our internet and television viewers to the program. Remember, if you're watching us via the internet or TV, you can email us your questions at any time during the program to live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. As always, we're going to be joined by some interactive video conference schools throughout today's programs. We're going to meet some students from Salmon, Idaho, some folks from Brenham, Texas, some kids from Jennings, Louisiana, and via Skype, some students right here in St. Louis from St. James the Greater School. It's the science behind rivers and dams, and the guests that are going to help us go through this topic and explore it are right here to my left. So let's begin by letting them introduce themselves. Let's start, first of all, by talking to David Gordon, who works with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. David, thanks for being with us. Thank you. And give the students an idea about what it is you do with the Corps of Engineers. Well, my main responsibility is navigation on the Mississippi River, making sure that there's enough depth and width for barge traffic to get up and down the river especially in the St. Louis area. Very cool. And Ryan Christensen is to his left from the United States Coast Guard, a bos bosun's mate on, the, on his ship. Ryan, talk to us a little bit about the Coast Guard and what it is you do. Well, I uh, drive a uh, tugboat for the Coast Guard, and I also work with, the, uh, with industry and with the Army Corps of Engineers to uh, regulate where the buoys go to mark the channel that the Army Corps maintains. And to his left is a man who was a river barge pilot and now is responsible for making sure those barges get to port successfully. That's Shannon Hughes, who works for Kirby Inland Marine. Shannon, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Tim. Give the students an idea about what you do. I'm a port captain for Kirby Inland Marine. I manage over the towboats themselves, and that can be a wide array of discussions. And we'll have a chance to talk about all of that. So we'll find out what it means to, with those barges going along the rivers, the tugboats going along the rivers. We'll find out about the transportation issues. We're going to look at environmental issues today. We're going to talk about the nature of the river, the ebb and flow, the rise, the fall, the flood, the drought, what the, what's done to try to control the water levels of the river, both in terms of economic interests, as well as recreational interests, as well as agricultural interests, as well as environmental interests, as well as those potentially endangered species interests, all of those things and more. Don't forget, you can email us your questions to live at hectv.org. We thought we'd start with a little bit of information about the river itself in general and about the Great Rivers Museum that's in Alton, Illinois. And we're going to talk to Angie Smith, the director of the Great Rivers Museum for the Army Corps of Engineers. And as we do that, I want you guys to look at some video footage that we've got here of the location there, the Melvin Price Lock and Dam, which is Lock and Dam 27, if I'm remembering right, 26, 26 on the Mississippi River, located right there in Alton, Illinois. Angie, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure, thank you. Talk a little bit about the museum. Well, what we do at the museum is our main mission, really try to connect people back to the Mississippi River. There are so many components associated with the river from the navigation, the commercial industry, the environmental components, the recreational aspects, and our job is to find an interest that somebody can just get back to the river system itself. And when we talk about the nature of the watershed of the Mississippi River, give the students a little bit of an idea about its size, its scale. What are we talking about here? Well, as you mentioned, the Mississippi River itself is about 
2,250 miles long from Lake Itasca down to the Gulf of Mexico. It encompasses almost 31 states of, within its watershed, and it is the third largest river system in the world. So as, when you're talking about size and just sheer volume of water coming through, it's, it's a pretty massive thing. And uh, when you think about inland waterways, this is one of the major river systems that we're going to focus on. And if we just define the word watershed, watershed is like any of the area of land that happens to be fed by or drained by the Mississippi River and its tributaries? Well, for this one specifically, yes, but a watershed in general is just a, uh, an area of land that goes into a specific water body. So, for example, the um, Mississippi River watershed encompasses that area I mentioned. Um, smaller watersheds can come into play uh, with the tributaries of the Mississippi River as well. Okay, very good. She mentioned, of course, that the Mississippi River starts at Lake Itasca in Minnesota. I don't know if any of you have had the chance to go to Lake Itasca. The beginnings of the Mississippi River are exceptionally small indeed. You can actually walk across you the river, right? And it's very shallow in that part of the, the watershed. That's right. Very good. You can walk across. We wanted you guys, since obviously the Great Rivers Museum is located at the Melvin Price Lock and Dam in Alton, Illinois, we wanted to give you guys a chance, not just in the video we just saw, to see the lock and dam in terms of its size and scale, but also to get a sense of how locks and dams operate. And this is a model of the one you specifically have there, right? Correct. This would represent Melvin Price Locks and Dam right there at the National Great Rivers Museum in Alton, Illinois. And uh, what we have here is that the, the Upper Mississippi River is so shallow that it, it needed this series of locks and dams to help maintain a certain depth of water for commercial industry. So uh, what the locks and dams do is um, they just help maintain flow and then creates more or less a stair step for the commercial or recreational traffic up and down the river system. So this model represents upstream uh, the higher water levels into the downstream lower water levels. And right now um, we're showcasing a, a barge sitting inside a lock chamber. What happens at these locks and dams is once the barge sits safely inside the chamber, um, all we have to do is close off the gates on the upstream side and shut off the valve. So this creates a, an area of no flow either in or out of the chamber at this point. Now to stair step down to the downstream side, we would open the downstream valve. Uh -huh. Now there are no pumps associated with this, it's just a series of gravity fed valves. Okay. So you can see the, the barge slowly starts to lower as the water goes from inside the chamber into the downstream section. And then once the water level equals out, we can open up the gates and the barge heads on down the river. So. And the time process that it takes for a barge to go through it from beginning to end? At Melvin Price, where a, a full tow of 15 barges and a towboat can actually fit inside the gate, it's only about 30 minutes from start to finish. So very efficient process. And does the process work the same, like if I'm canoeing in my kayak or something, do I go through the barge in the same way, a, uh, pardon me, through the dam in the same way a barge does? You would. Okay. And unless you have a marine radio, there would be pull chains on either end of the chamber itself. You can contact the operations center at that point, and then they would filter you through just as a, a commercial uh, recreational watercraft would go. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we want to give our students a chance to ask questions right off the bat because we're going to do a lot of interaction during today's program. So you may have a question about the watershed in general, and you may have a question about the operation of a lock and dam. So let's start by going up to Idaho. The order we'll go with these questions will always be the same. Sam and Idaho, let's go to you guys. Do you have a question right now for Angie about the lock and dam, about the museum, or just the nature of the Mississippi watershed in general? How many lock and dam systems are there? Excellent question. There are 29? 29 on the Upper Mississippi River system. And again, that's just for the Mississippi itself. There are other locks and dams associated in other waterways. But for the Mississippi River, from basically the headwaters in the Twin City and down in the Twin Cities area uh, to the confluence of the Missouri River, there are 29 total locks and dams. And, and what dictates the placement of the lock and dam? Like it should go here. Does there have to be a definite decrease, so to speak, in the depth of the river, like the si you know the height of the river or whatever between, or is it because it's in a population area and there's more boats going to go through? How do you determine where they go? Well, that was determined several years ago back in the early 1930s when uh, the whole uh, system was actually put into place. And I'll probably revert to Dave Gordon on that specific yeah. question uh, since he's more the engineer and can focus on that piece of it. But um, as far as how far they're placed apart, it just varies up and down the upper Mississippi area. So. For example, from Melvin Price up to Lock and Dam 25 in Winfield, Missouri, we're talking about 40 river miles. Okay. Okay. David, because the camera can catch you over there, anything you want to add about that idea about like why they go where they go? 
Yeah, that was determined uh, in the early 19th century when they started building the entire project. Uh, the Mississippi River had a lot of rapids, uh, especially up in the Rock Island area. We could build locks and dams in those areas so that boats could get over those rocky areas. Okay, very cool. Let's, I want to go to Jennings, Louisiana next. Jennings, let's go to you guys for a question. Okay. okay. What's the difference between the lock and dam you're discussing and a spillway? In May of this year, we had to open the Marganza <coughs> spillway to avoid flooding of New Orleans. How are they different? Dave, do you want to talk a little bit about that too? Go right ahead. You can speak to that right over there. Lock and dam is, is for uh, navigation on the Mississippi River, and, and it's basically for uh, periods of low water. As Angie stated, the, the upper Mississippi River is very, very shallow, and times like this time of year, when uh, boats would have a hard time to that part of the river. So the water backs up in that part of the river and allows commercial navigation. Uh, a spillway, on the other hand, is for times when uh, you have flood flows on the river. You got a lot of rain, and, and especially down in Morganza, where you need extra capacity for the river uh, to, to place its water, uh, you open up these spillways to bypass very populated uh, areas. Very good. Thanks for that question. We'll come back to you again, Jennings, but that's an excellent question. Let's go to our group of students who's in Brenham, Texas. Brenham, a question from you guys. How do you use locks and dams to manage the upper Mississippi River during a drought? Oh, during a drought. Use it utilizing for a drought versus something else. Angie, you want to talk about that? Sure. Well, the upper Mississippi River, this whole system was put into place basically to maintain a nine-foot navigation channel for our commercial industry. So what happens during uh, low periods of water or, or drought-like situations is the gates on the dam would actually close off all the way. So if you can see here, if they're open, you see some flow. If they're closed, it actually helps maintain a higher pool on the upstream end. So that's what the, the locks and dams actually do. And it's maintained, the water control or the level is maintained by the gates on the dams itself. Very cool. Great question. And speaking of questions, we're being joined via Skype today by St. James the Greater. And I think Ricky has a question about the Mississippi River and its stream order. So Ricky, St. James, take it away. Again. We haven't been able to determine the stream order of the Mississippi River. What is the stream order classification? They haven't been able to determine the stream order of the Mississippi River, and they're wondering what is its stream order classification. Now, I will happily, well, not sorry, happily, but I will indicate my ignorance at this moment in time because that's not a topic I'm familiar with in terms of stream order classification. What are they talking about, Angie? Well, there are different stream orders. So there's primary tributaries or secondary tributaries, et cetera. A primary tributary would be the first part of a river system coming in. Once it's joined by another river, that becomes a secondary. And if another river system comes in, it's a tertiary, et cetera. So with the amount of tributaries coming into the Mississippi River, we're talking about a very high order of river system here. I mean, we're probably in the quaternary or, or even bigger. That is a great question. Thanks for that question very much, St. James. We look forward to continuing to talk about it. Before we move off just the nature of the lock and dam itself, anything that didn't come up with questions or in terms of its operation that you want to make sure the kids understand? Well, uh, the best thing to pay attention to is that, again, it's not run by any sort of pumps or anything like that. It's just a series of gravity-fed valves, and I think that's really important to think about. And then when we start getting into some of the other as associated topics with this, I mean, we did change some of the environmental components. Um, we're looking at better navigation for commercial and uh, recreational traffic. So it's going to be interesting to see where the questions go. Well, very good. And as we move to our next topic, we want you guys to see a little bit more video of the Alton Dam itself. You're seeing a barge go through the lock and dam there in Alton. Those are the gates that they're actually closing to change the water level. Yes, those are called miter gates on the lower end. Miter? Mi miter gates, yeah. Okay, and I should think about like, like yeah. miter, like a miter saw yes. because they're at an angle? Correct. Okay. And that's the upper lift gate there. That actually lifts out of the uh, bottom of the river and lifts straight up. Okay. And is the barge that we see here going through right now, is that pretty typical, Shannon, of barge sizes that we would see on the river? Do they get much larger, et cetera? What's the nature of that? <laughs> that size is very common. Uh, they can be twice that size in width. The lock would accommodate twice the width okay. of the toe. And you guys have, are there two channels that they go through it in Alton, the lock and dam? There's a, like there's a wider and a narrower one? Well, they're actually both the same width. Okay. They're, they're both 110 feet wide. Uh, one's just longer than the other. One's twice as long. One's 1,200 feet and the other one's 600 feet. And what's the, why well, have the two? What's the difference? Just in terms of being able to send more through at once or? Yes. Uh, most toes on the upper Mississippi River are 1,200 feet long and they can fit in the 1,200 foot chamber. Very cool. And the, and the, and the 600 foot chamber is used for smaller vessels or a backup chamber. 
All right. You guys may have more questions about the nature of locks and dams or the river in general. Don't forget you can also email us your questions to live at hectv.org. I've got my cell phone here with me because any email questions we have coming in are going to be texted to me so we can add them into the conversation. But we want to move along now and talk a little bit about the hydrological cycle of the river as we talk about the river in general and the nature of its watershed. That's kind of a fancy little phrase there, Dave, hydrological cycle yeah. of the river. Uh, when I think about water cycles or whatever, I think of that whole evapotranspiration cycle yeah. I learned in fifth grade. I think was fifth grade social studies. Is that what we're talking about here? Is there something similar? Exactly, except it's on a massive, massive scale when you're talking about draining an area the size of the Mississippi River, where you've got a, a bunch of different climates. Uh, you've got the, the Rocky Mountains, all the uh, snow melt in the Rocky Mountains draining into the Missouri River and down into the Mississippi River. Uh, you've got rainfall in the Great Plains. Uh, you've got rain uh, all the way in the Appalachian Mountains, snow melt there. And, and how all that combines in the Mississippi River and all the way down to New Orleans and the Gulf of Mexico. So it is all those sources of water that flow into the river in the same way that rain and all that stuff is like flowing down. If I just think about it like watering my plants, so to speak, in the garden. Correct. Yeah. It's all those water sources coming yeah. together. So there are times, I'm assuming, automatically, because of the nature of, of, of the climate, where the water level of the Mississippi is going to rise. Like I should, like as, as ice begins to melt in North Dakota, Minnesota, et cetera, up north, I should automatically expect that the Mississippi River is going to rise naturally? Uh, not necessarily. Okay. Uh, because all the different systems that feed into it, you could be having a drought on one part of the Mississippi River and uh, rainfall or snow melt on another part, and it could equalize, let's say, in the St. Louis area. Oh, okay. I, I might get lots of high water up north, but it, by the time it gets down to me in St. Louis, it isn't high anymore. Yes, correct. Or okay. you could get a bunch of rain uh, up in St. Paul. Uh, while you're having a drought on the Missouri River, mm -hmm. and by the time it reaches St. Louis, it's not a big deal. Okay. But in St. Paul, it could be flooding. And Shannon, when we think in terms of barges and dealing with the, the natural cycle of the river, um, is there a difference, or describe to me the difference between operating a barge in like low water, so to speak, versus higher water? Do you change the way you operate with the barge because the speed of the river is faster, or do you have to think about that? Yeah, the conditions change daily. High river conditions, flood conditions, the, the current's moving a lot faster, things happen a lot quicker, you have to adjust farther in advance of how you're going to approach something. And so when you think about from the perspective of being, you know, the port captain, does it change, does the, the height or lowness, the speed or whatever of the river, whether it's in flood or low water, does it, I, I assume it changes the traffic that's coming through your port and does it change therefore like, you know, how long they've got to stay in port, so to speak, as opposed to be able to get back out into the river? Yeah, the, one of the biggest factors in low water conditions is involved in navigation is waiting traffic. There's okay. a lot, there's more places that you have to wait traffic in low water conditions versus high water conditions. Therefore, you get backlogged in the fleets or things don't flow as smooth as, as they do in higher water conditions. No pun intended in terms of that flowing water. Um, Ryan, from the Coast Guard's perspective, I'm assuming that in times of higher water and floods, you guys are, I would assume, you're more likely to get some sort of accidents you have to deal with in lower water, or, or does it make a difference? Well, they're just two different animals. Uh -huh. in, in higher water, our buoys that we put out to mark the channel don't survive very well. They get uh, hit by the trees, they're covered in grass, so they get pulled underneath the water. And, uh, but, uh, and there is more flow and, and uh, there's more current. But in lower water, there's, there's the shoaling that happens. So, you know, we have to go out there a little bit more. We really have to work with the Army Corps and, and get good surveys of troubled spots. And uh, we, we have to find the edge of that channel and try to get ahead of the industry. And when we put out our buoys, we have to try to predict a bit of a, gr of a drop because we're not going to come back there the next day and mm. move the buoy again, you know. So we look at a week or two ahead and try to put the buoys so when we get back we can get them again. Okay. Well, I want to go back to our student groups to see what questions you guys have, might, might have about the hydrological cycle of the river, other things that cross my, your minds. We've gotten some email questions I want to get to too, but let's go back to Sam in Idaho again. Sam, another question from you? Why don't they use the Mississippi for energy too? Ah, okay, that's an interesting question because we obviously along the Missouri River and other rivers, we have hydroelectric power plants, dams are used to create all sorts of energy. David, can you, can you speak to that? In fact, the Mississippi River is used for power production. Um, up, up north, uh, there, there's a major power station. Uh, 
that's a, an area where the, the head is high. That, that means the difference between the upper water level and lower water level is great. And that's where you generate the most power in those type of areas. And that's why you see a lot of power dams out west is because they have a lot of mountains and they can get that, that high head. Uh, newer technology nowadays is making it so the, the lower head where you get maybe 10 or 15 feet of difference, uh, you can generate power as well. And a lot of power companies are looking at the Mississippi River as a, as a renewable energy source mm -hmm. more so than it's been used in the past. Great question, Sam, and I wouldn't have thought about that necessarily. Great question. Let's go to Jennings again in Louisiana. Another question from you guys? One student wants to know if the water level's higher or lower, does that affect before the dam actually opens, how quickly a boat can go through? <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. In terms of the, the, if the river is higher naturally, does that affect the, the operation of the lock and dam in terms of the speed that a barge can go through, or do, are you able to control it no matter what because of the nature of the lock and dam? Actually, at, at higher water, it is quicker to get through the locks and dams uh, because that difference in water level is maybe uh, a half foot to a foot. So it's a lot quicker to, to drop the chamber or, or, or raise the chamber. Uh, during lower flows, uh, when you have a, a a high head on the one part of the dam and a lower part on the other, then it takes a lot longer. Great question, Jennings, and we'll come back to you for more. Let's go to Brenham, Texas again. Brenham, another question from you. What's the, what is the future of the Mississippi River, uh, and will it be used to transport goods in the next 25 years? Okay, that's a good question, because obviously the nature of the Mississippi River has changed over time. As you guys think about it from a Coast Guard perspective, as you guys plan for the future about whether it's going to be recreational uses or you know the balancing all those things you guys do, do you see a lot of changes in the use of the Mississippi River? Have you seen transportation, for example, of the barge industry increase over time? Is it decreasing? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think it's a super highway. I think uh, barge traffic is a cheaper way to move goods, and uh, it's not going to go away. And uh, I think we see increased uh, during times when high fuel prices, right? Uh, more goods get moved along the rivers and, and on rails because they have more capacity, and it's, and it's cheaper per pound or, or per item to get it to the place that it needs to be. So, you know, the future is, uh, I think, just a different version of the present. You know, I, I don't see us changing using the, the river for commerce, lots of commerce. Shannon, anything you want to add about that in terms of, as you notice, trends about transportation, barge use? I think that it's steadily increasing the number of barges that's on the river, the number of boats that's on the river. It's on a steady increase. Okay, very it's good. It's the most fuel efficient method of transporting goods. Oh, well that's a good thing for yes. people to realize, except the fuel efficiency. Obviously it's yeah. more fuel efficient than like trucks going across interstate highway systems and stuff. Yeah. And it's one of the safe, safest modes of transportation as well and environmental friendly. Very cool. The email question we've gotten from somebody who's watching us online deals with differences between dams, designs, and our structures based on where they're built. Like, for example, the Melvin Price Lock and Dam looks a certain way, obviously, because that's where it is. Do most locks and dams along the Mississippi River look similar to that, or are, they, are there some significant differences based on where they're placed? Uh, Melvin Price Locks and Dam is one of our newest structures. Uh, it was built uh, in the 80s and 90s. Um, many of our other structures were built in the 1940s, so they look quite different, but they're, the way they operate is quite similar. Uh, it's just the newer construction, newer design, uh, the fresh look of concrete and everything else. Uh, but overall, the, the, the concepts are the same and the okay. design's the same. Very good. Don't forget to keep sending us those email questions to live at hectv.org. I want to go back now via Skype to our friends at St. James the Greater School here in St. Louis. St. James, do you guys have another question you'd like to ask our guests right now? Come right on in. The water of the Mississippi in St. Louis appears to be very turbid. Has the increase in boat and barge travel affected the diversity of plant and animal life in the Mississippi in the past century? Oh, great question. Very detailed. So they're talking about the fact that it appears, at least when you're in St. Louis, that the water of the Mississippi River is pretty darn turbid. They're saying pretty turbid. Has the increase in boat and barge travel affected the diversity of plant and animal life in the Mississippi River? And you talk about in this particular area, or how is that balanced out, so to speak? Who would like to speak to that to start with? Uh, well, actually, the turbidity in their water is, is very good for certain types of fish. Uh, okay. Maybe we should define turbidity just to make sure everybody yeah. in the audience understands that. Talk about what yeah, turbidity that, that, is. That's the, the amount of, of silt and, and clay and other particles in the river that makes it not clear like the ocean. Okay. Um, but that's actually conducive to certain types of fish habitat on the Mississippi River. Okay. Especially like the endangered pallet sturgeon, uh, which is a, a very old fish that's endangered on the river. Uh, it likes those type of environment. 
Very good. As they talk about that and, and, and diversity of plant and animal life, we're going to have a chance to talk a little bit more about environmental aspects in a bit. But I also want to make sure that we talk, as we talk about the hydrological cycle of the river, we begin to talk about flood and drought and the relationship between that and the river and also about controlling the water levels uh, and the impacts on communities as we do that. When we look at floods, and this year was kind of a, a big year for floods along the Mississippi River. And obviously, many of us lived in St. Louis in 1993, and we were, were aware of another flood. That's actually when I moved to St. Louis. And the footage that you guys are seeing on the video screen right now is footage from the 1993 flood, if I'm correct, in the St. Louis area along the Mississippi River, um, where water levels were exceptionally high. And you could basically go to the arch and stand at the top of the stairs of the arch, and mo the, the street below you and a good deal of the stairway coming up the arch was underwater. There's different reasons we get floods, and there's different different reasons that certain sections of the, the river might flood. When I think about it, David, does it go back to like what we're talking about in terms of the hydrological cycle? Is the flood a combination of factors of the fact that there was like a high snow melt or an increasing amount of rain or whatever? What causes this to happen in a way that makes something a crisis versus hey, it's just a little bit of water? Yeah, you're correct. Okay. Uh, every season is different. Every year is different. Uh, the 93 flood was caused by a certain set of factors. The flood of 2011 was caused by a totally different set of factors. And a lot of it has to do with timing. Uh, when does it rain? Where does it rain? Uh, if you get rain on one watershed and you get rain on another watershed at the same time and it meets at the same place on two different rivers, you're going to get a big flood. Um, for instance, the, the, the flood of 2011, there was a lot of flooding on the Missouri River, uh, but not much in the St. Louis area. People were asking, well, why? Uh, well, the upper Mississippi River wasn't flooding at the time. So we had high water, but not the extreme event that they did out in the Kansas City area. But then you go down south and in the Memphis area, they had extreme high water. Ohio River was up. So uh, it's those combination of factors and the timing of when water gets where it is and when the snow melt melts and when it rains that uh, makes every season completely different. And Shannon, um, I know you've talked about this a little bit, but do you guys, do you actually train barge pilots and like to deal with high water versus low water or are there like simulators you guys use or like uh, are, do they actually get training hours on the river and they're like supposed to drive in different you know types of river height speed whatever the right phrase would be in the same way that hopefully when my dad or the driver's ed person is teaching me I get nighttime practice on the road as well I mean do they do all that kind of thing when you guys are training you're correct they they have simulations and they can have different river stages in the simulation uh, and they train on the job as well. You know, the, there's seeing the river in flood stage and seeing it, you know, at low water conditions as we're, we are now in St. Louis. It's a uh, two different animals, so to speak. And there's nothing, the simulators is a great tool but there's nothing like on-the-job training. Yeah, it's the difference between being in, there still exists the driver's ed classroom where you used to be able to sit behind the wheel and pretend that you were driving and actually getting onto the road system. And Ryan, do you guys train in high water conditions? Because obviously you've got to be ready for rescue in flood situations and high water conditions. Do you also do regular training exercises that help you prepare for that? Or Well, I, we're, we're always looking at training, but I think the operations is uh, what really makes it so you're uh, ready for it. Um, you know, we, uh, we have to go out when the weather's bad, you know, just like I was stationed on the Gulf Coast during Katrina and, and uh, my family knew that they had to go somewhere else because uh, as soon as the thing went through, I was back to work. Mm -hmm. So um, I think just being out there and doing the job and getting that on the job training is the most valuable thing that we do. Let's go back to more student questions. We'll keep the same order. Sam in Idaho, another question from you. How much training do you have to have to drive the barges? So how much training is done to drive a barge, Shannon? It's approximately a two-year training program. Uh, from start to finish, you can figure three years okay. to become a pilot. Good question, Sam. And Jennings High School, let's go back to you guys in Louisiana. Hi. Uh, the question now is, who pays the cost? In your terms, in terms of cost, like dealing with flood damage, cost in terms of dealing with the expenses that they incur because they've got to respond to floods, what kind of costs are you asking about, Jennings? 
wheel the dams itself to let the barges in and out. Is someone manning those dams oh, 24 very, hours a day? Oh, very good question in terms of paying for that. So like when dam when barges go through in terms of railroad transportation traffic, does does a barge uh, pilot pay a fee? Is there like do I think of it like a toll bridge, a toll uh, road? No, there's there's no fees. It's okay. Blocks, just like if. If you're a canoer, uh, recreational boater, you don't pay anything. It's completely free to go through. Uh, the federal government uh, pays the cost to the personnel that operates the site to make sure everything works it properly to maintain the sites. Um, however, the, the, the tow boat pilots do pay a, a user fee on their, uh, they pay a fuel tax that goes towards any new construction or rehabilitation of uh, existing locks and dams. Okay, very good question. So that's your tax dollars at work. That's a great question, Jennings. Let's go back again to Brenham, Texas. Another question from our friends down there. When it comes to environmental management of the river during floods, do you test the water for metals? What happens when a test shows a high level of metals in the part of the river? A no, Angie, no. Angie, I'm going to come to you. Don't worry. I'm getting up now and walking. Come to Angie so that she can a answer this question and talk a little bit about that, Angie. Well, um, I'm not sure about the metals specifically, but there are typically environmental quality tests that are always being done on different bodies of water, and Mississippi River definitely being one of those. So uh, they're looking at uh, water clarity. Uh, we talked about turbidity a little bit ago. Um, there are some different tests for metals. I'm sure the Environmental Protection Agency would come in if needed. And um, as far as what happens after that, that gets into more of the regulatory process, and we don't deal as much with that side of it, but um, there are definitely tests constantly being done. And a lot of uh, citizen science work going on out there, so volunteer groups are regularly out there monitoring different systems, tributaries, et cetera, and uh, that's what I would challenge some of you all watching is to get involved with some of your local tributaries and, and water bodies. Well, very good. Great question. That's an absolutely great question. And St. James the Greater, let's go back to you. Another question via Skype? We have learned that wetlands are essential for migratory birds. Have dams impacted the flyway of these migratory we birds? And if so, are steps being taken to assure that these populations aren't negatively impacted? Oh, a great question is we continue to talk about some environmental aspects. They're asking specifically about wetlands and the nature of wetlands being essential for migratory birds. And do dams impact the flyways of the migratory birds? And if so, what steps are being taken to deal with that? Like, and I know you've got some stuff happening up at Melvin Price for sure dealing with that. David, you want to talk about that in general? Uh, yeah, Angie probably talk about the environmental aspects, but I can tell you what we do from an engineering point mm -hmm. of view. Uh, we manage our lock and dam structures to maximize the benefits for uh, the migratory birds. Uh, we'll uh, hold our, our, the water down uh, temporarily in certain areas uh, that grow a lot of grasses uh, in certain areas of our locks and dams. Uh, those grasses feed the migratory birds at certain times of the year. Uh, so we can, we'll try to operate our structures the best we can to maximize the benefits for, for the environmental community. Okay, and um, David, I'm going to ask you to join me as we go over and talk to Angie, because sure. I think this might be a nice little segue for us to talk about some of these okay. dam structures that help do that as well as we answer this question in, in, in some detail. But Angie, you want to talk about that also? Yeah, definitely. Uh, as far as the Mississippi River goes, I mean, if you think of the immense amount that uh, of land this has, uh, almost 50% of duck species fly along the Mississippi Flyway, along that corridor. And another third of the inland waterway freshwater fish species actually use the Mississippi River for going up and down the water. But I mean, that's um, over 150 fish species alone. So uh, as far as loss of habitat, um, the engineering structures, they have actually been doing a lot of work to maintain habitat and work with the river instead of just completely channelizing it or anything. So, as, as, and Dave's going to show you a little bit about some of our fish habitat and how that uh, it gets associated with the structures themselves. Yes, yeah, St. James, this is a great question for us to segue into this model that we're going to look in. So, David, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you uh, in to do, talk about this. So, describe to the students a little bit about what we're looking at here in terms of what this represents as a model. This represents a straight section of river. Uh, most people, what most people see on the Mississippi River when, when they see it is they just see the water surface. Well, what we're interested in a lot of times is what's happening below the surface, and that's what's really, really interesting is you've got a lot of sand, gravel, cobbles moving along the river every day of the year, thousands of tons of this stuff moving along, along the river bottom, and, and the shapes uh, are, are very unusual. You can get a lot of sand waves, you can get scour holes, you can get uh, sandbars that are all great for, for habitat. And so when I actually see like the, the sand moving along here, this is, I'm noticing that the river is flowing this direction. So we're actually seeing the speed of the river and it, like, yep. it looks like it's going faster on this side than it is going over here. Correct. 
And the question about environmental aspects and the wetlands areas for migratory birds, birds really is uh, impacted by what we're looking at here because you guys are going to notice that there's different structures in this model that represents different kinds of dike structures or kind of uh, environmental structures that are put in to control the flow of the river both in terms of channelizing it for transportation but also to create environmentally safe areas for certain species. Let's talk first of all about the one here that's shaped like a U, what's called a chevron. Correct. Uh, most of our structures we built out there, like I said, for navigation purposes, but we try to engineer things, again, uh, for environmental purposes as well, have dual purpose structures out there. And this is what this type of structure does. Uh, it creates flow all around the structure. Uh, it creates flow uh, over the structure, uh, creates uh, scour holes, sandbars, and all kinds of nooks and crannies for, for fish to hide in. And, and, and for different water currents. So depending upon what the species is, some of them might thrive in this area where there's actually the water flowing and some yep. of them might be better off inside the chevron, so to speak. Correct. We do, we've done all kinds of studies and seen uh, a variety of species in different areas depending on where the water's flowing. And you guys saw some pictures that we had at the beginning of the show in that montage as well as later where you saw the examples of the chevrons along the Mississippi River, like that image you saw of the city of St. Louis, for example, near that railroad bridge was a chevron. Now these guys back here, what I'm seeing here is a different kind of structure, right? Yes, those are called wing dikes or wing dams. Uh -huh. uh, what we use those for is channeling through the river, but we can also modify them uh, to create uh, additional habitat. So let's say if this structure, these structures are here three in a row, we can channelize the river, but that doesn't provide a whole lot of great habitat off the channel. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is, uh, instead of building a straight rock structure, we can just simply add notches into them in strategic locations. And if I notch each one of these, you can start seeing how we're getting water oh, through fully, the structure uh -huh. now, which again creates different types of habitat, different areas where the fish can migrate and, and hang out in and, and get food. And so when we think in terms of like creatures that are, you mentioned the pallid sturgeon and am I remembering it's a piping tern or some sort of... Um, a piping plover. Thank you, piping yeah. plover, yep. thank you very much. Um, that are on the endangered species list. Do you deliberately, like, for those kinds of, 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 of wildlife, do you deliberately build areas or like are there certain areas where you're thinking where you've got to because of the nature of where their, their habitat is that you create structures to make sure they're going to thrive there? Yes, we work hand in hand with our biologists uh, at the core and with the Fish and Wildlife Service and Department of Conservation and they help us determine uh, what kind of structures to build and then we'll, we'll design things that will help the habitat in those certain areas. You guys may have more questions about habitat, so let's go to that and find out what more questions you have about habitat are these kinds of structures, and there's all sorts of structures that exist in the river to make these kinds of good things happen. Let's go back to Louisiana again. Jennings, a question from you. How much does it cost to build a dam, and how long does it take to build one? All right, we're talking about costs of dams and the length of time. And that's going to vary depending upon the structure. So I guess let's talk first of all about the, the something like the lock and dam at, at Alton, the Melbourne Price lock and dam. That's obviously years to build? Yes, I, I believe it was around 15 to 20 years to build at a cost of about a billion dollars. Uh, now to build that structure again uh, would, would probably cost a lot more in this day and age. And when we look at these kinds of structures, the chevrons, yes. the, the wing dikes, those kinds of things, What's the speed to build these kinds? Uh, we, we can build those within a couple weeks. Okay. Uh, they're, they're basically just very large size rock, anywhere from, from small boulders like this up to the size of a car that are, that are placed uh, from the river off barges and, and dragged into the river into those shapes. So I'm not seeing any poured concrete in these locations? No, no. The, the, it's all rock that comes from the bluffs along the Mississippi River quarries uh, that's taken directly from the bluffs onto barges, transported into these areas and, and built on site. Very good. Brenham, Texas, let's go to you guys again. Unmute your microphone and come in with your question. How has the economy affected the management of the river and its habitat? Oh, okay, great. So how does the economy affect communities on the river and its habitat? Like, we can talk about, we'll, we'll go ahead and switch back and, and move back over here too, David, so we can bring in Shannon for this question as well as we talk maybe about some economic interests as we think in terms of, of barge traffic, et cetera. Have you noticed in times of economic downturn a decrease in barge traffic, for example, Shannon? Yes, approximately a year and a half ago, a <clears throat> year and a half, things got slow. There was lots of boats tied up, lots of barges. Uh, as of today, things are booming again. We've recovered and carrying on. And would it be accurate to say that in economically difficult times, obviously governmental money becomes strapped just like private industry money becomes strapped as well. And have you guys been dealing with that kind of just budgetary concern regularly, whether it was related to wetlands management or wildlife management or just other kinds of activities that you do? 
Yeah, every, every year is different with the federal government as far as how much money they, they provide uh, different agencies such as the Corps of Engineers. Uh, for the past few years, uh, you, everybody heard about the ec uh, Economic Recovery uh, and Stimulus Act. Uh, well, a lot of that money w uh, came through the Corps of Engineers to uh, build a lot of the things that uh, we haven't had a chance to build in, in the years. So uh, we had shovel-ready projects that we were able to put on the river, uh, river training structures we were able to rehabilitate uh, one of our locks and dams, so we put that money to good use. And this gives us a chance to talk a little bit more about communities, which is one of the things we want to discuss about controlling water levels, and that's impact on the community and obviously economic impacts as well. The, na the fact that the lock and dam exists in Alton obviously has an economic benefit to that community just to start with, I would assume. Oh, absolutely. And, s and that's not just an economic from the perspective that people are hired by the lock and dam and barge traffic is going through, but I assume there are other like tourism impacts, recreational impacts, because there's a whole like wildlife refuge area there, right, and th those kinds of things. Yeah, uh, Angie can probably speak more to that. That's where she works, and that's, that's her area of expertise. Angie, I'm going to come back to you for that in just a moment because we're going to talk about that. Um, but we want to give you some, as we, before we talk about that, we also want to have a little bit of conversation in terms of what Ryan does and other folks done when they talk about controlling water levels and impacts on communities because we've spent some time obviously talking about floods. And a good deal of what we just showed you with those uh, dikes is obviously is attempting to channel the river so it flows beautifully for the barge traffic, and it makes a good environmental area obviously for species to exist, but sometimes the water becomes so high as in 1993 or this year in 2011 when all sorts of things happen to happen. And our technical director, Colby Marshall, actually has some home video from 1993 of his grandparents' house uh, and the, it being underwater. And we want you guys just to see this video from 1993 as we talk a little bit about impacts on communities and coming back from that. And, and Ryan, as the Coast Guard works with communities, both in terms of like, were you helping communities do sandbagging operations, for example? Obviously, you're doing rescue operations, true, but what do you do at moments like this? How does the Coast Guard interact with communities to you know, help prepare them or to deal with the trauma of being flooded? Well, that's what we're doing, search and rescue activities. We have uh, the, these small uh, um, flooding punts, they're called. They're just little boats that uh, we can drive around when you're down, driving down a street and you, uh, you're driving past the top of the stop sign or the top of the street sign in uh, somebody's community, uh, doing search and rescue, doing uh, saving people's pets, you know, bringing them back. And then uh, there will be a lot of times that we will have volunteers go out and do sandbagging as well. We've, we're involved in a lot of sandbagging projects to, in, in the local communities where we exist as well. Very good, very good. And, and Angie, I'm going to come back to you so we can talk about the wetlands things. But while we're on here, we're talking about low water, high water. Bob emails us a question. Again, thanks for sending us that question. It's live at HECTV.org. And Shannon, we're talking about high water, but this one's about low water and particularly about ice. Do barges get stuck in ice? Do barges get stuck in low water? And what's it like when that happens? Yes, they do get stuck in ice. Uh, in low water, I'm assuming we're referring to a grounding. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, that does happen in low water as well. In the ice, you you basically rely on other companies, other towing vessels to come and help you through the the problem area. In the in a grounding situation, you have to offload a barge into an empty barge, which is called lottering a barge. Mm. Bob, thanks very much for that email question. And we've, we've seen some images. Uh, this question deals with dredging. And I know we've got some images of dredge cutters for you to talk about and, and, and dredge cutters, dredge potters to talk about. They say, so they, when you dredge, what does that, does that in any way, how does that disturb the bottom and does it change the silt flow or the flow of the river t down the river? How does it affect, for example, the amount of silt that's coming out of the delta, et cetera? Uh, it, it really doesn't affect anything downstream. Uh, when we dredge, especially in the St. Louis area, uh, we take the sand and basically put it off on the side of the channel. So that sand, during high flows, is going to end up back in the channel flowing down south. Uh, the, the problem with dredging is that it's repetitive. Uh, when we go out there and dredge in a certain area, we'll probably be back there dredging the following year and the year after, and that's a cost that is incurred by the federal government. So, so we prefer not to dredge if we can do it with other uh, water level management or dikes, uh, such as we saw before, that's preferable. And those images we just saw, uh, uh, those, those dredging ships, those machines or whatever, um, they can move lots of soil at once? Is it just like they're drilling down in? Or are they like big like you know, shovels pulling it up? And how, how do they well, operate? We have uh, two different types of dredges that we work with. Uh, one's called a cutter head dredge, uh, which is, it looks like a big saw on the end and, and a pump. And it 
cuts through the material and is usually for harder type material. And then we have a, a unique dredge called dustpan dredge, uh, which looks like a, a big dustpan going down the river. Uh, it's got water jets that shoot into the river bottom, agitates mm -hmm. the sand, pumps that sand out, and casts it all on the side. Oh, very cool. I'm going to get to more questions from our student groups, but as you guys look at that image, I'm going to switch over and come back to Angie so we can talk about that wetlands question that we got. Talk a little bit about what's there at the Lock and Dam in Alton and what the difference that it makes for species. Well, I know on the uh, Missouri side of the river, we have uh, what's called the Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary. It's a 3,700-acre piece of property that has been managed and uh, is currently used for migratory bird habitat. Other species also use it. That's the benefit of recreating some wetland or uh, habitat areas. Uh, it's primarily in a prairie uh, ecosystem. There are some wetlands and bottomland hardwoods uh, forest ecosystems associated with it. But uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of migratory birds do come through this area. We've had more than 320 species alone of birds come through and uh, currently monitoring for the interior least tern, which is an endangered species. We have some uh, actual managed habitat for that species themselves. Um, we also have some endangered plant species out there. There's a false aster that's uh, planted within the uh, Migratory Bird Sanctuary and an excellent partnership with a lot of our area organizations and agencies from the National Audubon si Society to U.S. Fish and Wildlife to Sierra Club, uh, Living Lands and Waters who works regularly on the river itself cleaning up trash. So um, these partnerships just really help um, bring back habitat and recreate some of the, the areas that may have been lost over time. And this might be a good time for us to mention to the audience, if they're not from the St. Louis area with it, familiar with that location, is that this is an area where we're going to be getting to see bald eagles come wintertime, right? That's correct. Talk a little bit about that. That's an amazingly impressive thing. The bald eagles will slowly start making their migration here in the next month or so. Um, as the water freezes up over in the northern parts of the country, um, up in Minnesota, Michigan areas, they, the eagles will actually make their way down. And uh, numerous eagles, I mean up to 200, 300 at a time, you can see in one area. And typically what they do is they come down to where our locks and dams are because on the downstream side of those structures, the ice isn't really allowed to uh, form because of the, the fluctuation and just the, the turbidity. So um, the eagles will come in, you'll see them fishing right below the structures and uh, great eagle viewing if you're ever in the area. St. James the Greater, you guys had another question that you wanted to ask, so I wanna go back to you guys, then I'm gonna go to some more email questions. St. James the Greater, I've got that question here. I understand you're having a little bit of a, a technical issue and they're talking about uh, as we look about environmental aspects, they're dealing with mercury levels. They've done some research about mercury levels, PCBs found in the Mississippi River. Like, is it part of the Corps of Engineers' job at all to monitor those kinds of levels and in some way manage them? Is that more of a private sector job? How do, how do you interact with like all those industries that exist along the river in terms of making sure that you know, the pollutants don't get into the river inappropriately? Uh, we do some monitoring of our own uh, on the Mississippi River and at the Lake Project. Um, most of that falls under the purview of the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, they do a lot of monitoring and they, uh, uh, they'll, they'll go to these industries to make sure they're not discharging what they're not supposed to be into the river and, and, and impose sanctions and fines and, and enforce those regulations. Very good. And a question that's kind of a follow-up to your sandbagging work, Ryan. What happens to all those sandbags after a flood? Do they get environmentally disposed of? Do, you know. It's kind of an interesting question that we got via email. Thanks again, Yeah, well, folks. I mean, sand is also an aggregate for concrete, and sandbags are sold at, you know, Ace Hardware to go in the back of your uh, truck. So mm -hmm. I, I don't imagine they're wasted. You know, it's a, it's a renewable, it's a resource that hasn't really changed. The bag of sand is still a, a bag of sand that can be marketed somewhere, so. Our final step is to for us to talk a little bit about working together to sustain the river. And you guys have probably noticed that throughout the program, that all these various groups are working together. The Coast Guard's working with the Corps of Engineers. Obviously, the barge operators are working with the Coast Guard and the Corps. The, the wetlands management that you've got, the various organizations that Angie just mentioned as we talked about the wildlife refu refuge area. There's all sorts of interaction that works together to sustain the river. And as we begin to talk about that and think about summarizing, I want to go to each of our student groups for some final questions that you guys might have as well. So, Salmon, let's go back up to you in Idaho. Do you have another question you'd like to ask at this time? No, how much Start how again much wildlife for me. is affected when it floods? How much wildlife is affected when it floods? Well, that's obviously going to vary depending upon the nature of the flood and the location of the flood. But in, what do you notice about that in terms of like the return, so to speak? You know, land gets destroyed, the return back. What's the, 
what's the time frame that you've noticed over time about things getting back to normal? Well, I, I can probably speak to the fish in the river. The fish mm -hmm. actually depend on that cycle. They, they need that flooding cycle. They need water in those backwater areas, and that's all part of the, uh, the, the cycle of water. Um, you need those areas that the fish can get back into, and those they provide nursery areas. Um, and then you need the, the drought times as well. So you need that entire cycle for fish habitat. Very good. Let's go once again to Jennings, Louisiana. Jennings, another question from you. We have two questions. What is the need for dredging? So the dredging is used for what kinds of purposes, David? Uh, like I said before, we need to maintain that nine foot navigation channel. Uh, so times of flooding, we have 40, 50 feet of water in the Mississippi River, but during those uh, low water times of year, like in the fall, we're, we're now, uh, sometimes we get those areas of shoal or, or sand popping up in the middle of the river channel that Shannon can't get through. Mm. Uh, so we have to monitor the river to make sure we don't have those areas popping up. And if we do, then we got to send a dredge out to remove that material, get it out of the way so Shannon can get his barges through. Okay. Very good. Jennings, let's go to your second question, and then Brenham, Texas, we'll go to you. What season is best for the water flow to continually flow through on the Mississippi? Oh, is there a seasonal difference in any way, shape, or form that you've noticed? Anyone? Ryan? Spring's pretty wet up here, so... The, I mean, the, the snow melt that happens up north makes spring a pretty Absolutely. wet time. The river's and, usually and, flowing pretty well. Yeah, and I, I, you know, how fast the snow melts, I think, makes a big difference. Whether they get a lot of uh, hot uh, temperatures out in the western states melting that snowpack really fast, or whether it, it occurs over a few months. So, Very good question. Thanks, Jennings. Let's go back to Brenham, Texas. Your final question, Brenham. Are there plans to build dams to prevent future floods? Oh, in terms of like dealing with floods and dam control. Uh, so does the Corps of Engineer have plans in terms of like our projects in the works dealing with like levee controls in the St. Louis area, region you're familiar with, or changing things for flood protection? Uh, uh, as far as dams go, most of those have been already built. Uh, they were built over the last hundred years. Um, and and that provides most flood protection that we see in the, in the Midwest. Uh, as far as the levees go, most of those are constructed as well. Uh, most of our dams and levees are both very old and they need constant rehabilitation and or maintenance through the years, uh, especially with flooding cycles that tend to damage those structures. Uh, they constantly need to be maintained by uh, the local communities and the federal government. David, as we begin to summarize here, are there things about the Corps of Engineers and the work they do that you would definitely like to emphasize to the kids that we haven't been able to talk about yet? Anything that comes to mind that would be another important thing for them to understand? Yeah, not only do we do navigation and flood control, uh, we have a lot of hydropower up and down the river. Uh, we do uh, uh, recreation and, and, and fish and wildlife habitat are, are, are key areas. Um, and then we also have people that support the, uh, the, the war on terror. Uh, they're overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan as we speak, helping to rebuild those countries. Uh, uh, engineers, the Corps of Engineers are real important in that role and they support the Army. And Ryan, if someone's interested in the Coast Guard as a career, lots of exciting opportunities? There's lots of exciting opportunities, and since we're talking about the environment, I mean, we, we definitely have a uh, large environmental mission to do here, and there are small detachments of people throughout the Western River system, throughout the watershed that is the Mississippi River, that do both investigations of spills and do uh, inspections of the facilities and the boats that operate on there to try to, you know, make sure that our environment is worth passing on to our next generation. So. Um, there's opportunities for if you like the environment and you want to be a part of somebody that helps regulate it and, and then the Coast Guard's great for you. If you just like to drive boats and get out on the ocean like I do, then uh, it's good for you as well. So they let me drive boats. Very cool. <laughs> and speaking of driving boats, Shannon, anything else about operating barges that we haven't had a chance to touch on yet you'd like to mention? I'd just like to say without the <coughs> help from the Coast Guard, the Corps engineers, that the Water transportation would not be near profitable as what it is. Therefore, you would be putting more trucks on the road and the highways would be more crowded. It's, it's a, thanks very much. a big help. Great. Shannon, thank you. Ryan, thank you. David, thanks for being here. Angie, thanks for being here. I'll wave over to you. We're really glad that we were able to partner with the Army Corps of Engineers, with Shannon, with the Coast Guard, uh, with the Great Rivers Museum for this program. Don't forget, it's going to be archived on HECTV.org, so you can watch it on demand at any time. It'll also be on the HECTV page on iTunes U. Next week, we're going green as we talk about recycling and the environment in a different way. Thanks for joining us, everybody.